I grew up in a community that believed that true Christians, aka conservative evangelicals, were the most persecuted group in America, if not the world. There are places in the Bible I was taught that say that Christians are persecuted and that we are blessed because we are so persecuted, but that does not mean that we don't suffer at the hand of our persecutors. Most people even believed that if they were persecuted, that meant that they were doing something right. If you were persecuted, that is validation of your status as a true Christian. Now, what persecution looked like to these mostly white, middle-class, conservative Christians was very different than what almost anyone else would consider persecution. Basically, when other people were allowed to live their lives openly and proudly as non-Christians, and when Christians didn't have more privilege than any other social group in the country, that meant that Christians were being persecuted. It's really hard to say how much I bought into this idea. I was also taught that I was incredibly lucky, incredibly privileged to be born in America and to be born into a Christian family. There was really no better lot in life than the one that I was handed. So on one hand, I felt very lucky to be raised the way that I was and very privileged to be in the position that I was born into, but also felt like maybe somewhere out there people are trying to get at me. Maybe I'm going to be in danger if I step outside my Christian bubble. My life day to day growing up as a Christian didn't feel like the life of someone who was persecuted at every turn, and yet I was told that I was. It, it was a bit confusing to have those kind of mixed messages being sent to me. But something that did sink in was the idea that persecution could look like simple disagreement. That perspective, though, was significantly challenged when I eventually lost my faith and became an atheist in secret. Suddenly, I was terrified of having honest conversations with the people that I loved and trusted the most, much less people in my general community in East Texas, where I was living at the time. Never before had I had the experience where if I had revealed what I really thought, revealed my true identity to the people that I loved and trusted the most, I risked being severely socially ostracized, if not entirely cast out of my most important foundational social circles. After all, everyone that I knew and trusted founded their very identity in the idea that Jesus rose from the dead and wanted to have a personal relationship with them. I had rejected that relationship, so what would that mean for their perception of me after finding that out? So I socially isolated myself. I hid my identity constantly. One time I mentioned at work that I believed in evolution and I was almost fired. Now I was working at a Christian homeless shelter where they totally could do that because I signed a written statement of faith in order to work there. But the fact that I almost lost my job over something that doesn't even entail atheism really confirmed my idea that if I let my true thoughts and feelings slip, then... Maybe that would be the end of my status in any social group that I ran in. Now, plenty of you who've been following me for a while know that after I moved to a new city, got a new job, found social support from atheist groups I found online, I did eventually come out to my friends and family as an atheist. Some of the responses were really not great, and some of them were a lot better than I expected. But I learned something very crucial in that time that affects my thinking daily, even up to now. That thing was what it was like to actually experience even an ounce of marginalization. Before becoming an atheist, I really did not know what it was like to be ostracized, to have people have unfair biases against me just because of what I think, what I believe, what I look like, etc. I remember thinking back at that time, if this is what it's like to be a kind of marginalized minority that can hide their minority status pretty easily. What is it like to be a marginalized minority that can't? What if I was trans? What if I was black? It made me have more compassion and empathy for those who have experienced marginalization than I was ever even capable of having before. So in this way, becoming an atheist might have been the single most important formative experience on my perspective of issues of social justice, namely that they're important and require constant effort even now. 
When I've shared this perspective of mine in the past, I've had some Christians and even some atheists say that no, marginalization is not a real thing that atheists actually have to deal with. There aren't any atheists that are really socially ostracized in the US. I'm just playing the victim for, for views, apparently. To those people I say, you don't have to take my word for it because there's actual data to support the idea that atheists might be one of the most socially ostracized groups in the United States. Today we're going to take a look at some of that data and speak with a social scientist who compiled it. My name is Dr. Ryan Burge. Uh, I hold a PhD in political science from Southern Illinois University. Uh, I am a scholar of religion and politics, especially in the American context. I've published about 30 articles and book chapters in peer-reviewed outlets uh, about religion and politics and the measurement of one or the other. Um, I've written several books, including The Nuns, uh, first edition and then second edition just came out, a book called 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. And uh, I have a book coming out in August called The Great Dechurching with Jim Davis and Michael Graham, which are two pastors. Uh, speaking of pastors, I'm also a pastor. I've been a pastor in the American Baptist Church. Uh, for basically my entire adult life, three years as a youth pastor, and then um, 16 years as the senior pastor uh, of First Baptist Church of Mount Vernon, Illinois. Uh, I've been married. Uh, my wife and I got married in 2007, and we have two boys who are 11 and 9. You wrote an article recently on your Substack, right? Graphsaboutreligion.com. Graphsaboutreligion.com. The article is titled, Just How Much Do Americans Dislike Atheists? Now, some of my viewers might be like, wow, I've never heard a pastor say that atheists might actually be disliked rather than that they're, they're, they're ruling the U.S., you know? And, and you, you open up this article talking about how there are some narratives about evangelicals being the most persecuted uh, group in America. I was personally taught that. Sounds like you were taught that. But you think that the data maybe makes a more complicated uh, statement than, than that narrative. Is that accurate? I mean, I'm always obsessed with persecution narratives. You see it on the left and on the right, right? Like, oh, the right always thinks the left hates us or trying to censor us, and the left thinks the right's trying to censor them. You know, it's everyone always tries to look for instances of persecution because it like means you're doing the right thing, quote unquote. And I think that in religion, like it, that is just like ground zero for finding persecution narratives. And uh, if you grew up evangelical, you'd hear it all the time, right? Like mar being a martyr was like the greatest thing you could possibly do. Like I grew up, I grew up, I was born in 1982. So Columbine happened when I was 12. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was a story about a woman named Cassie Bernal who, uh, yeah. you know, like it, no one can really confirm if it's true or not. But the, the shooters came into Columbine High School and said, do you believe in God? And she said, yes. And they shot and killed her. At least that's how the story goes. And she is like revered in evangelical culture as like a, a martyr for the faith. And you get that in a lot of religious traditions. You know, Judaism has it. Islam has it. Um, you know, even different cultures, like nationalistic cultures have it as well. So um, I, I think that these persecution narratives actually are really interesting from a sort of objective sociological perspective. And so I, I wanted to kind of, I had all these disparate pieces of data out there about like how people view atheists and I wanted to kind of put them all into one cohesive that's really what I do on my substack is like I have all these like disparate pieces of data and I want to make them like into a cohesive argument and this one is the atheists are probably the most disliked group in American society today interesting okay let's jump into some of the data some of the graphs that you made out of the data thermometer score of various groups by political partisanship can you tell me what's going on here this is a complex looking graph it is. So um, one of the one of the tools we use in polling is called a, a feeling thermometer. It's been around for like 50 years. And basically what, you, what we ask folks to do is place the following groups on a scale from zero, meaning very cold, to 100 being very hot and 50 being like neutral. And um, so what I did was they, they always ask about these weird different groups. And it's kind of fun to see like where they put people put different groups in in, in space. And so I broke it down by Democrat, Independent, Republican to kind of show you that like people think like the anti-atheist bias is just really a Republican thing. It's actually not. It's like an everybody thing. And that's kind of what the point is. So like if you look at the bottom of the graph, this was in 2012, by the way. So that kind of colors this a little bit. Um, the Democrats put the Tea Party lowest. And that's so cute because like the Tea Party is like, ah, you know, like that was pre-Donald Trump. They scored a 30, you know, which is low. Uh, but if you go up the scale, like the next one is Christian fundamentalists at 42.1 and then atheists are right above that at 43.4. So like Democrats don't even like atheists that much. Average scores of 43 amongst independents. They score 39.1, which is like basically the same as Congress, which is the lowest of any um, mm -hmm. group in there. 
And then amongst Republicans, um, they don't like <laughs> – I love how – here's the three most hated groups by Republicans. Liberals at 31.7, the federal government at 32.8, and an atheist at 33. So, like, Republicans hate atheists as much as they hate the federal government and liberals. Um, but I really just wanted to show people, like, how much – and if you look at, like, the groups that people like, like, Christians score really well amongst Republicans. They score, like, a 78. So, you know, there's definitely on the right – even amongst Democrats, Christians do relatively well. They score a 68 amongst Democrats. So Christians are liked kind of universally. And atheists are sort of disliked universally on the left, right, and center of, of the political spectrum. So it's not just a partisan thing. It seems like when you break down Christian into smaller groups, though, like, say, Catholic, Mormon, uh, the, that score goes down. When you say the word Christian, it seems like that's the most positive uh, word to use, the, the word that people have the most positive things associated with and, and then rank highly. Is that Would you say that's right? Yeah, and that's just because like Christians is like I'm a Christian, you know. It's like a generic sort of like you can like you can be a, a mainline Christian or a, a Catholic or a, you know what I mean. Like it's just so like amorphous; it doesn't really mean anything. And I think that's why it scores so high. Because also the other thing is people like what they are. You know what I mean? Like very few people are self hating. Like I'm a Christian and I hate Christians. No one says that. So like yeah. that's why they do well across the board. I mean, they're not doing as well as like working class people, though. Notice that like working class people score higher than Christians do. Right. Um, actually, I was love to look at these and go, if I was going to run for president, like how would I hit all these things the right way? Like I love working class people and I love middle class people and I love Christians and I like the military a lot. OK, everyone's with me. You know, like that's how you win an election. <laughs> you see a lot of that throughout throughout like all of American history or maybe especially in the 20th century populism works on the left and the right now right like everybody's like i'm for the working man and all that and biden's even talking about bidenomics right from the middle out and all this stuff i mean i think there's still no matter what we're still going to be a, a, a country that loves the working class like the underdog the person who grew up without anything like that's the kind of person we love when it comes to religion though i think that this is in 2012 i wonder if we did this again if it would look the same like i think christianity would probably go down the list a little bit for democrats and atheists would go up I'm not saying that atheists would get universally loved, but I think they'd probably score a little bit higher because they've grown significantly as a share of the population in the last 10 years. And you don't have that many self-hating atheists. So that would probably raise it just by by natural you know, progression that way. OK, now the next graph was particularly interesting to me because um, let's just say that it has uh, some personal meaning to me. Chairs saying that they would be unhappy if a member of their immediate family married either a born again Christian or someone who doesn't believe in God. Can you, can you break down the results here? Yeah, this is, I love this Pew question. I, I, sometimes Pew really does a good job of like trying to conceptualize this in a very practical way. Like, do you dislike atheists is a bad polling question. Okay. Cause it just, it, it just doesn't work. But if you can like operationalize that in a certain context, like what happens if your son or daughter married an atheist, like that changes everything. That's where the rubber meets the road. And so yeah. Pew asked these in, in 2014. And, and the one thing I want to point out to start with is overall, only 9% of Americans said they would be unhappy if their kid, someone in their family, which is basically, let's say their kid, um, married a born-again Christian. Only 9% would be unhappy if their family member married a born-again Christian. It's 49% would be unhappy if they married a person who doesn't believe in God. So like wow. it's... Uh, you know, like this whole like evangelicals are persecuted. You look at this and go, no, what? No, <laughs> like 90 percent of people are fine with their their kid marrying uh, an evangelical. And if you look, obviously, white evangelicals do not want their kid to like 77 percent of white evangelicals be grumpy if their kid married an atheist, which yeah. sort, sort of makes sense. You know, I, I think that this family context is hugely important, at least f for me, the, the, the main way that I have experienced I guess we can call it ostracization, has been within more of a, a close friends and family context. So seeing this graph specifically, I think, really really speaks to me and I think will speak to a lot of my audience, too. And also notice how amongst, like, atheist agnostics, 28% of them would be mad if someone in their family married an evangelical, but 13% would be mad if someone in their family married an atheist, which kills me. It's like, we, I'm an atheist. I don't want my family married an atheist. I want to be the only atheist in my family. That's what it feels like. Like they're going to crowd me out or something like that. So yeah. it's like, it's not symmetrical. 
You know what I mean? Like the 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 the, the, the animus is not e even both directions. There's a lot more evangelical anti atheist bias than there is atheist anti evangelical bias, which I think kind of explodes the narrative of, of evangelicals are way more persecuted. And now I'm seeing nothing in particular here. It it seems like there's actually more bias here against someone who doesn't believe in God among people who are just not religious in, in any particular way versus there's there's a little bit less for born again Christians. You would you would think that would be different, but I I guess not. I think nothing in particular people actually are actively rejecting the atheist. You know, they're actually rejecting they're, they're re rejecting religion for sure, right? By saying they're nothing in particular. But I also think by them not saying they're atheist agnostic, they're actually actively pushing back on the other side too. So they kind of live in this weird in between between not atheist agnostic, but not religious either. And I think yeah. you can kind of like, I want to do more with that group specifically to like try to figure out who do they dislike more? The uh, religious people or, or atheist agnostics. The assumption is they're none. So they're going to have more affinity towards atheist agnostics. But I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. I think they might have more, they might be more angry at the not the, the atheist agnostics than they are at the religious people. But again, I've got to sort that out. Hopefully in this next project I'm working on, that'd be part of the goal is to tease that apart. I've had plenty of people in my comments section, especially when I've talked about your work, uh, say that, oh, you know, the nuns, they are effectively atheists and agnostics, uh, but they, you know, they for some reason are, are self-hating or they just refuse to take on the label that really does describe them. And, and you've talked about in your work that belief and belonging are not the same thing. So yes, some people at least, or even a large portion of people who are nothing in particular when it comes to religion, might fit the definition of agnostic or atheist when it comes to what they believe, but where they identify, how they identify, who they think they belong to might be very different than that. I've certainly met people that that was the case for. I honestly think in some ways the most malign group in America is nothing in particulars because atheist agnostics don't want to claim them. Yeah. Like if I show a graph where it says like the people who are most likely to be non-religious are are the least educated people, which is true, statistically a fact. The, the atheist and I go, wait, no, no, don't don't lump us in with the nothing in particulars. Don't do that. But then when I say, well, the nuns are 30 percent and I add the nothing in particulars to to get to that, they go, oh, look at us. We're rising quickly. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I've seen that so many times. You, you can't pick them when you like them and then kick them out when you don't. You, they're part of you. And the thing is, no one advocates for them. No one talks about them. They don't have any organizations built around them. They're floating in social and cultural space. They're sort of left out and left behind and lost and unmoored. And they're, to me, as a social scientist and a pastor, they're really troublesome because they, I feel like they feel like no one is fighting for me. No mm -hmm. one is, is advocating for me. Like atheist agnostics have these great organizations that, you know, Freedom from Religion Foundation, the American Association of Separation of Church and State. Like there are great organizations that fight for these kind of causes. There's no one that fights for nothing in particulars. And, and it's unfortunate because there are 23 percent of the population. And amongst yeah. young people, it's a third. It's the plurality it is nothing in particular. And yet no one talks about them. And and they should be. I they, they they're just getting kicked around by everyone and it seems just so unfair to those folks. Yeah, absolutely. Now this is a good place to move on to the next graph. Do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of the following groups? You start with uh, the Church of Scientology here and it goes all the way down to Protestantism. Can you break this down for me? This is YouGov data, which is great. YouGov is like this polling firm that does all kinds of these weird like they like they, they did one yesterday about like who do you blame for the recession like what factors do you blame for like the economy right now and is in, like democrats republicans gas prices stuff they do all these cool polls they drop every once in a while and they basically did this one where they had all these different groups and asked people if they were had positive negative or really no impression of these groups and like scientology people hate scientology don't don't Scientology, please don't send me a cease and desist letter. I don't I'm I don't care. Like you can be whatever you want to be. Be a Scientologist. Doesn't bother me. But 66 percent of Americans have an unfavorable view of Scientology, which yeah. is like insanely high. Yeah. Um, it's it goes Scientology, Satanism, huge gap, right? 20 point gap. And then Jehovah's Witnesses and then FLDS, which is the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. Those are the people who like Warren Jeffs was their prophet. and He molested all those girls and went to prison. Right. Awful group. Uh, and then Christian Science. These are all small groups, by the way. Let's let's keep that in mind. Like these are yeah. not numerically large groups. Um, and then Islam is next, so that's a large group. That's like one percent of America. So that's that's forty three percent unfavorable. And then look at this LDS, 
is right below that. Not yeah. FLDS, like the mainstream Mormon church is not very well liked. And then it goes Wicca at 40% unfavorable. And then atheism at 38% mm. unfavorable. It is the lar- of those groups that are above it. Atheism is larger than all those groups. Yeah. Okay. So it's really the most disliked large quote unquote religious group in America. And then agnostics are further down at at 28% unfavorable, which puts them right around Pentecostals, <laughs> which is weird. It's like, what do they do to you? And um the Falun Gong, which is like this weird fringe like movement that most people don't even understand. Yeah. So um, yeah, so a- atheists score pretty darn high on the unfavorable metric uh, around some company that is not well liked, you know. Yeah, definitely. But I want to point one thing out is that you're you're seeing a really large portion of people being pretty indifferent. Thirty nine percent of people seem rather indifferent about about atheism. That's a great point. I think the, the, the general public's um, uh, common view on this question is live and let live. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I think honest to God, when it comes to religion, most Americans are like, hey, whatever works for you is cool with me. Just keep it to yourself. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what you see is like in a lot of these, like the, the middle response, which is like neither favorable nor unfavorable, runs like 40, 50 yeah. percent. So the general the general sense here is you get there's some groups that are really not liked. And there's some groups where it's like, eh, but the majority of you in America is like a big shrug of the shoulders for, for most groups. So I don't think there's like active. You know, there's not a ton of like active hate towards atheists. And I couldn't, I, I don't have the raw data for this survey, but I bet you dollars and if you pulled out the evangelicals, the unfavorables for atheists would drop dramatically. Mm. You know, probably in the teens, I would bet. You go on to discuss that exact point. Let's take a look at this one. What is your personal attitude toward members of the following religious groups? This is General Social Survey, which is like the, the, the Rolls Royce of, of, of survey data. It's done since 1972. And they kind of they added this question randomly. I don't really know why they just do stuff like this sometimes. But the question is, what is your personal attitude towards members of the following religious group? And this is atheists. Mm-hmm. I mean, amongst Democrats, it's it's 34 percent positive, 23 percent negative and then 43 percent neutral. So that's like plus 11. That ain't bad. Biden's not plus 11 right now. Biden's like <laughs> negative eight, I think. Um, amongst independents, it's zero, 24 f- p- positive, 24 negative, 52 neither. So like right in the middle, right? So no, no feelings there. And even amongst Republicans, it's only 34% negative and 23% positive. It's actually a mirror image of the Democrats, right? So they're 23, 34, the, the Republicans are 23, or 34, 23. So like they basically offset each other. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. But even amongst Republicans, it's only one third of Republicans who have an unfavorable or negative view of atheists in 2018. Yeah. That ain't that ain't terrible. You know, like it's not good, certainly, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. So we're we don't seem to be talking about massive swaths of people that absolutely hate atheists, think that they're horribly immoral and really should just be completely eradicated from public life. We're talking about a small minority of people who dislike atheists and then with plenty of people who are a part of those people's same group saying i don't i don't really care either way is that right unfortunately the human mind is not well equipped to understand statistics we're we're we're, we're primed for story Mm. you know like uh, the example i always give is when they had the rollout of the covid vaccine right and they were giving out millions of shots a day like nationwide you would hear like this one story about this one guy in Florida who got the COVID shot and six hours later he was dead. We're like, oh, God, the COVID shot. You don't hear about the planes that land safely. And in those days, like millions of planes were landing safely every day as people were getting the COVID shot and not getting COVID. You know, right. so you might have a one instance, right, where someone is discriminated against because of their race or their gender or their belief system or, or lack of belief system, whatever it is. But the data says overall that is an outlier event. And that is not indicative of the general consensus about Americans and their view of atheists. All right, let's move on to, I believe this is the final graph here. Yeah, last graph. It is necessary to believe in God in order to be a moral person, have good values. Uh, yeah. This is starting with evangelical Christians. Let's go through this. Yeah, well, evangelicals are the only group where clearly a majority says you have to believe in God to be a moral person, have good values. 70% of evangelicals believe that. Amongst Catholics, it's 48%, which is basically like half. You know, statistically, it's half. And then b- the entire sample average is 41%. 
So you put five people in a room and only two people out of five believe that you have to believe in God in order to be moral and have good values. So yeah. three out of five don't believe that. So, you know, like I started this by saying, like, look how discriminated atheists are. And then I kind of give you data that says, yeah, they are. But like, it's not as bad as you think it is. The average American's not walking around going, you're going to hell because you don't believe in God. They're like, eh, I believe in God and I think God's cool. But if you don't, you're probably OK. You know, that's not the, the predominant view is very much sort of a laissez faire libertarian view of, of, of atheists. By the way, I love the fact that four percent of atheists think that you have to be, you have to believe in God. This is something actually like it's actually a good point. The more you look at data, if that number was zero, I'd be very suspicious mm. because there's always like wiggle, there's like slop in data all the time, and it never lines up like perfectly. If it does, that's good evidence that your data is cooked, right? Like that it's been manipulated um, improperly. Yeah. So when you have a little little like play in it like that, it makes me go, okay, that's good data. Because there's there's stuff in it that makes no like logical sense because the uh, a share of the American public makes no logical sense. Right. Yeah. People can can fill out a question wrongly or misunderstand it or just have a, an opinion that is very different than something you might predict. Right. And that's OK. Like, that's what we want to see. To me, it's actually a validity check more than like, oh, that's so stupid. Like I sometimes I post grass like this, go look at that idiot over there who believes this thing. I go, uh, listen, that's actually a good thing, man. Like that's showing us that the data actually works. Check my check my claim here. I want to run this by you. It seems like there's not a significant enough number of people just generally in America that say that atheists are immoral to say that atheists generally in, you know, day to day are going to be discriminated against. They're going to get kicked out of stores. They're going to, you know, they're probably not going to experience persecution on a day to day basis in the way that certain minority groups might have in like you know, Jim Crow era, right? It's it's not the same thing. However, it seems like there's a significant enough of portion of certain rather powerful or influential groups that politicians may be able to appeal to them and appeal to the idea that, that atheists suck, you know, in order to kind of shore up support from people who have that opinion. I, I, I want to run that by you. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's a lot. I think there's something to be said. Like, there's always this like thing you have to have. You have to have Darth Vader to be Luke Skywalker. You know, I mean, you've got to have like a compare, like a reference case. Interesting thing I learned in grad school. You know, one of the hardest groups to raise money for is in America, an advocacy group, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. You know why? Huh? Because there's no mothers for drunk drivers. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would. I would assume not. Yeah. So like, you need an enemy. You know, like you need to create an enemy that that may not exist or maybe only exists like in a very like diminished form. But you need to like build them up as being like a bigger version of that. And then you can rebel against that and push against that, you know, straw man that you've created. And I think for a lot of Republicans, atheists are that thing that they've created. Now, they're the, the other part of this, though, like the other side of the coin is they're actually growing like about six percent of Americans today identify as atheists. It was three percent in 2008. So it's absolutely growing. It's actually not growing that much in the last five years, though, which I think is interesting. I think we're hitting like a cap. You know, the youngest Americans, only like seven or eight percent are atheists. So it's not like there's like this huge oncoming wave of atheists, but they are growing. And in, in, in 2020, 45 percent of Joe Biden's coalition that won him the White House were non-religious voters. Interesting. So it's like you got to hold these two ideas in tension, right? Which is like, the, yeah, Republicans are making a mountain out of a molehill when it comes to you know atheists in American culture, but they also the nuns are actually kind of being a, a bigger force in American politics at the same time. Um, I think everyone's everyone lives their own life, right? And everyone's experience is different when it comes to persecution and things like that. The one advantage atheists have is you could probably go your entire life and never tell a single soul you're an atheist and be just yeah. fine. You know, like you almost have to volunteer that like it, it, no one has. It's not a skin color. It's not a gender. It's not a sexual orientation. Right. Where you can go your entire life and avoid church, especially in the culture we're in right now, where it's just totally fine to not be religious and yeah. not say that you're an atheist. So I, I think that, you know, if you choose to roll that identity out and you make it central to who you are, like in your online persona, you're probably going to catch more crap on the way back because you've decided to make that part of who you are. And that's just a decision you have to make personally. Is it worth it to me? How important is it for me to be this way publicly?
Dr. Ryan Burge, thank you very much for coming on and talking to us today. I hope that this video ends up being a valuable resource for both Christians and, and atheists and just people in general who are wanting to explore this idea of atheists being ostracized in American society. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. If you want to hear more from me, then subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate in need, if you are experiencing persecution or ostracization, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.